Welcome back to another episode of Everything You Need to Know Before You Buy, a series inspired by Jake Baldino's Before You Buy series, where I gather all the news and trailers of an upcoming game and formulate an opinion on whether you should buy this game or not. I don't know if the game is actually good or not, since I don't have access to a review copy of some sort, so I'm in the same position as you, the viewer. But the whole aim of this series is to give you some knowledge and guidance for these upcoming games. Today I'm going to talk about Signalis, or Signalis, but I've heard people saying Signalis, so I'm going to go with that. Signalis is a survival horror game developed by Rose Engine, an indie developer comprised of two people. It has been spotlighted in a few specific events like the Tribeca Festival, which is a very interesting topic I'll talk about later, but first, let's talk about the game's background. Signalis is coming out on October 27th on platforms such as Xbox, the Xbox Game Pass, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and Steam. I recall seeing this game on Twitter around 2019, maybe 2020. The tag hashtag GameDev was recommended to me and I saw this tweet upon my feed by one of the developers, Yuri Stern, showing a snippet of their game. From what I saw, I got interested, so I followed both developers, Barbara Whitman and Yuri Stern, on Twitter. At the time, there wasn't much about the game except the teaser trailer in 2018, as well as a playable demo appearing in certain events like PAX East and Gamescom. In 2020, Rose Engine announced a Steam page going live with a brief summary of their game alongside an announcement trailer that showed a lot of improvements compared to the teaser trailer. It wasn't until June 2021 where Signalis was showcased to a wider audience, as it got featured in the Tribeca Game Spotlight a day before E3. I swear this got shown on stage during E3 in an Xbox showcase. Maybe it was in an ID and Xbox segment. However, I vaguely remember someone saying it was day one on the Game Pass, but I can't seem to find that specific moment anywhere. So please let me know in the comments if you find Signalis shown on stage. Anyways, it was in the Tribeca Game Spotlight hosted by Tribeca Film Festival, now known as Tribeca Festival. The Tribeca Festival was co-founded by three people, one of them notably being the actor Robert De Niro. The whole event is designed to showcase a diverse selection of films, episodic, arts, talks, and most recently, games. There's a bit more history behind it, just wanted to keep it short. In order to get your work featured in the festival, you have to go through their submission process, which actually costs money, and there's a chance your submission will not get selected. This was the first time Tribeca Festival spotlighted games, and I don't know how many games were submitted under the category, but Rose Engine clearly took their shot at it, and they managed to be one of the 8 games selected. And it's not every day you see Guillermo de Toro promoting your game as a result of it. Also, to note, this wasn't the first time Signalis got submitted into a festival. It got selected in the 6th Strasbourg Indie Game Contest, which was part of the Festival European de Film Fantasique de Strasbourg back in 2018. You gotta give props to Rose Engine because it looks like it was no easy feed, especially the Tribeca Festival. Even though we don't know how many submissions entered, it does prove that Signalis is nothing to sneeze at. It had to check a lot of criteria for it to be chosen. Which brings up the question, what is Signalis about? Signalis is set in a dystopian retro tech future. We play it as Elster, a technician replica, a type of android who suddenly wakes up from cryostasis only to find out that her vessel has crashed and that the pilot, Ariane Young, the only other person on board, has gone missing. Stranded on a frozen planet, Elsa sets out into the unknown, searching for Ariane. She soon discovers something that looks out of place, and delving inside, she receives a mysterious radio signal that changes everything. There was a demo of the game on Steam around May this year, but for some reason it got removed. Maybe it was time limited. Fortunately, we have the technology, so we're going to look at someone else's playthrough. All the videos used will be in the source list down in the description. Starting up the demo, you get greeted to the main menu, where you control, I assume, Elster's eye, depending on which option you are on. A very small but neat detail to add. As soon as you begin the game, there's this boot-up screen that vaguely appears for a split second before we wake up. Here's an updated image of it in one of the trailers. I believe the demo was an alpha build of the game, hence why. What I want to point out is the language is shown here, since it's used throughout the game and trailers. The first one is German, which is no surprise when you realise that the developers live in Germany. You'll see a lot of German throughout the game, from the items you collect to the rooms you explore. But it doesn't end there, even the characters have German names. For example, Elster is German for Magpie, and in this screenshot there's another character called Stoich, which is Stork in German. I wonder why birds, maybe we'll find out in the full game. The second language used here is Chinese, which is an interesting choice considering that the devs could have stuck with German only. 
It's not used as much as German. You can see it in the main menu, Elster's UI, and items, specifically the one near the end of the demo. My best explanation is that we're from an international organization, most likely from a German slash Chinese division. Moving on, as I said before, we wake up from cryostasis after the vessel we're in has crashed. As we emerge out from our pod, you'll notice that the game is in a top-down perspective, followed by the pixel and low-poly art style. In conjunction with the lighting and shadows, it really sets the atmosphere. Majority of the demo, you'll be exploring the Penrose 512, the vessel we're in, and our main goal is to exit outside. In the beginning of the demo, there's a room that shows the status of the vessel, as well as a crew status telling us that someone else is meant to be on board. That person is of course Ariane Young, the pilot, and it appears that her whereabouts are unknown. Also, you can collect an adhesive tape and a pistol, which introduce inventory management, a well-known mechanic in survival horror games. You can find ammo exploring, but you'll be needing them to fend off enemies, so you have to be resourceful. The enemies in Signalis are creepy. Honestly, that might be an understatement. As you can see here, we have to go straight down to the cockpit. But there's this gangly, no-arms, cone-faced creature looking at the corner who's in our way. You can fight it, and as soon as it falls to the ground, it does this squirm which really sets that creepy tone. You have to stamp on it to kill it, as it gives one last squeal before death. I can tell Rose Engine took Silent Hill as an inspiration, the squirming for sure, and there's this other enemy in the demo that resembles the nurses in Silent Hill 2 specifically. So we enter the cockpit, and here we're in a first person perspective. I believe this usually happens when you're in an important room, or if you're interacting with a puzzle or machinery, whether that'll be a control panel or a button pad for example. I like this inclusion. Not only it gives you a breather from the top-down exploration, don't quote me on that, they might pull a jump scare during these sections. The first-person perspective does showcase the retro tech design in its glory. Here, there's a faded picture of Ariane that you can get, and to exit out the Penrose, you have to go to the airlock room, outside to the left of the cockpit. The thing is, you need a keycard, which requires you to go through some puzzles and rooms. Also, you'll find a lot of notes and books that'll reveal information, like how a certain puzzle work to world building law. Once you get the keycard, which is cut in half, use the adhesive tape and return back to the airlock. Inside the airlock, you can use the card, which opens up the Ava suit, allowing us to step outside the Penrose. The opening scene of the game plays out. It looks like we've crashed in some kind of snowy terrain. Elster ventures through the harsh weather. Eventually, she sees something in the distance. The scene ends as we get control of Elster's point of view. Click straight ahead and you'll discover this hall with an unusual staircase. The game forces us downstairs, already you can tell this area is abnormal with the muscle coloured walls and how there's little to none snow on the floor. There's a small strange hall north of us leading straight to the ground with a faint glowing light deep in. It gives you the option to either crawl in or not, not like we've got any other choice. We crawl inside and end up in a secluded room. It appears to be a bedroom of some sort. There's a desk in front of us, and on top of it, there's a computer, a radio, and a tome. If you investigate the tome, Elster says that it feels like it's calling to her, followed by the option to pick up the king in yellow. If you do so, the computer and radio will turn on as we receive a mysterious radio signal. We then get bombarded with messages, could be subliminal to Elster, and glimpses of the full game, ending off the demo. Before we get into the next topic, I just want to add that The King in Yellow is an actual book written by American writer Robert W. Chambers. Published in 1895, the book has 10 short stories. The first four refers to The King in Yellow, represented as a play, an entity, and a symbol called the yellow sign. I can't really explain it all here, I only know the first four stories by watching this video by Tail Foundry, and there's even a 7 hour and 27 minute long audio narration of The King in Yellow by Horror Babble if you want to check that out. The question here is, why does this book appear in Signalis? I've got a rough idea, but I think we'll get the bigger picture once the full game comes out. There's this blog post written by Barbara Whitman on blog.playstation which I'll put in the source list. She reveals a bit more information about Signalis, like the area we're currently investigating is some kind of re-education and mining facility. And in said facility, we meet Stoich, who I mentioned earlier, is also a replica with a grim agenda. The blog post also goes into a bit of the world. A world where a totalitarian government called Usen reigned, which is apparent through the retro technology, surveillance and propaganda in the facility. Near the end of the post, it mentions the direction and inspiration Signalis used. 
For example, the replicas and enemies' black design are inspired by Tsutomu Nihei's Blam series, as shown here. I suggest you guys have a read through for more details. Finally, it's time to discuss whether you should buy Signalis. I'm going to say it's definitely worth the purchase. As of October 13th, there isn't a price on the game yet, but I would suspect that the game is going to cost around £20, maybe £25 on the high end and £15 on the low end. I'll be surprised if it's going to cost less than £15. If it's around £30, I say it's still worth it unless you're on a budget. However, if you're looking for a horror game this Halloween, Signalis checks all the boxes, especially since this game comes out on the 27th. The demo brings up a lot of questions I need to know, like the promise Elster has kept, the other replicas, and the white haired girl you see in the trailers. I assume there's going to be multiple endings or something to theorise by the end of the game. Also, let's not forget that it got showcased in the Tribeca Festival. I know I'm hyping that up, but that deserves some acknowledgement to the quality of the game. If they got impressed by the demo, surely the full game will be no exception. Signalis claims to be a love letter to PlayStation 1 era survival horror games, and I think it will deliver on that with flying colours. And that's it for this video. Of course, there are other games coming out this October, like Bayonetta 3 and Star Ocean Divine Forces, for example. I don't blame you if you have high priority buying those games, but hopefully this video has piqued your interest. It's been roughly four years in the making. This is Rose Engine's first big game. I wish them all the best, a great launch and success. I can't wait to play the full game. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this episode of everything you need to know before you buy. If you want to support the channel, be sure to like and subscribe. And as always, I'll see you guys next time and catch you guys later. Take care.